So it's my honor and privilege to introduce to us our today's first keynote speaker, Professor Sandra M. Schneiders. She has been a friend of the Oblates and a friend of the school for several years and has um, been an honor to be in class with her in biblical spirituality and to, um, to be able to learn, learn from Professor Schneider's um, amazing amount of knowledge and wisdom that she has. She's a member of the Sisters uh, Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and received her degrees from the Institut Catholique in Paris and her doctorate from the Gregorian University in Rome. She is Professor Emerita of New Testament Studies and Spirituality at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University, where she has taught since 1976. She is the author of over 13 books, including the revelatory text, Written That You May Believe, Jesus Written, Risen in Our Midst, and over 100 scholarly and pastoral articles. She's a frequent lecturer, retreat director in the United States and abroad, and one of the premier eminent scholars in uh, really founders of the discipline for the study of Christian spirituality. And so it's very uh, much an honor and privilege to welcome Professor Schneiders to the stage. Good morning. Quite refreshing to see people out in the rain this early because they're passionate about spirituality. The world is in much better shape than I think it is when I listen to the evening news. <laughs> if there's anybody who's not hearing me clearly, would you indicate that? Some people were having apparently a lot of trouble last evening. We don't want to repeat that. Is everybody hearing me? Okay. It is a joy and a privilege to participate in this conference honoring my, our colleague and my friend, Dr. Bernard McGinn, whose major life work has been to restore to the contemporary church, especially in the English-speaking world, access to the treasury of our deep, rich, enormously variegated mystical heritage, of which one distinguishing feature is that women played such an important part in that aspect of the church. My contribution to the celebration is less a finished academic product than a tentative project, an experiment in reading the spiritual signs of our time. Bernard McGinn's lifetime work in mysticism is a massive resource for both discerning and responding to those signs, which has emboldened me to try out this experiment in this select group. I mentioned Dr. McGinn's monumental achievement in the elucidation of mysticism as the context with, within which I want to engage in this paper with an intriguing and often cited remark of one of the premier figures of the Second Vatican Council, Karl Rahner. This renowned peritus, in one, in one, uh, who is, was one of the greatest systematic theologians of the 20th century, but his remark that continues to tantalize specialists and laity alike can sound like a kind of obituary for theology itself. If, as not a failed project, at least one whose shelf life has expired. The reawakening among Catholic theologians as well as the laity in the aftermath of Vatican II of a voracious interest in spirituality in general and mysticism in particular after its centuries-long academic slumber, was validated by Rahner in his slender 1967 book, The Christian of the Future, in one of the most quoted lines to emerge in the conciliar renaissance. And I quote, in the days ahead, you will either be a mystic, that is, one who has experienced God for real, or nothing at all, unquote. Of course, Rahner was not saying that the non-mystic would got, go out of existence, or even abandon organized religion altogether, but that no genuine Christian faith can exist unless it is rooted in direct personal encounter with the living God. Theology, in other words, is not the seedbed of spirituality, but the reverse. Spirituality, and specifically mysticism, gives rise to theology. This lecture will be a sustained meditation on this intriguing proposition 
at the end of which I will make a brief tentative suggestion about the relationship of my conclusions regarding mysticism to biblical interpretation, specifically the Gospel of John. First, let me specify that the situation I'm addressing in this paper, which was also Rahner's context, is that of the once called First World, basically North American, Western Europe, and the non-indigenous regions of Oceania in which an increasing proportion of the once predominantly Christian population has become increasingly non-theists or post-religionists or some other version of the nothing at all that Rahner speaks of as the only alternative to being a mystic. But what Rahner was predicting, we are experiencing full-blown. Second, Rahner, who died in 1984, was talking about the Christian of the future. His future is our present. So I would reformulate Rahner's famous statement as today, in our postmodern context, you must be either a mystic, one who experiences God directly and personally, or you will be, religiously, nothing at all. The primary cause of the religious alienation that Rahner saw looming on the horizon and that actually characterizes so many people today is the incapacity of either the culture in which we live or the institutional church to mediate the experience of God for contemporary people. It would take us too far afield to flesh out this claim in detail, but it is imperative to see what it means if we are to recognize the depth of the spiritual malaise to which it has given rise, namely a kind of impossibility for increasing numbers of our contemporaries to believe in and therefore relate to God. This con context has been appropriately called post-modernity, not just for chronological reasons, but because two of the pillars of the modern period in which God was a major, almost universally acknowledged factor, have been probably irreversibly undermined and they have taken the God of earlier times down with them. The first is a major epistemological development in which our basic understanding of knowledge, that is what we can know, how we come to know it, and how we judge the adequacy of our knowledge, has been radically and permanently subverted. We could call it quite simply the subversion in the last few decades, especially under the influence of ideology criticism, of the basic theory of knowledge that was the controlling epistemological paradigm from at least the end of the classical period through the scientific revolution, the enlightenment and modernity until the gradual emergence in the 20th century of post-modernity, which is our current epistemological context. Post-modernity as a cultural designation is almost impossible to define. It constitutes more an intellectual quagmire than a hermeneutical tool. But for our purposes, and in the context of religion and spirituality, we might point to two effects of the postmodern turn in our understanding of knowledge that have ramifications for our topic. The first is the subverting of the subject-object relationship, which characterized virtually all thinking, especially scientific thinking, about reality until the emergence of postmodernity. It makes theism itself that is, the belief in a God who is not simply a projection of ourselves, increasingly difficult for many postmodern people. To be egregiously simplistic, until the emergence of postmodernity, knowledge was understood as a relationship between a knowing subject and a knowable object. This classic model posited a fully constituted knowing subject, whose mind was a virtual tabula rasa, or blank slate, in relation to any potential object of knowledge, which, prior to being known, existed in, its inde in itself independent of any knowing subject. In other words, it, whether material or spiritual, was out there to be known. The process of coming to know involved the conforming of the mind of the knower to the object. I said this was egregiously simplistic, but we gotta get the picture. In other words, this epistemology was foundationalist and methodologically controlled and consisted in the conformity, more or less adequate, of the mind of the knower to the thing to be known. The objectivity of the known governed the subjectivity of the knower. Objectivity, 
The adequate conformity of the mind to the object was the very hallmark, the criterion of genuine knowledge. Perhaps the most radical change affected by postmodernity in this objectivistic understanding of knowledge was the emergence of ideology criticism, which questioned not only the ideal of objective knowledge, but the very possibility of its achievement. Not because of the limitations of our knowing capability, but because the very existence of a fully constituted freestanding object was questionable. Postmodern epistemology recognized that the mind was not a tabula rasa, but an agent whose activity was not merely a response to the object, but actually, at least partially, constitutive of the known. For example, we now recognize that God has been imaged primarily as male, not because God is, in fact, objectively male, but because virtually all the influential God-knowers were male. Which leads to the more radical question, is God, regardless of gender issues, perhaps not something other than, our, not something other than ourselves, which we come to know, but something we constitute because of our needs? In other words, might it be true that part of the, most, of the postmodern turn to the subject entails a recognition that what we've called God, the supreme object, is really simply a projection rooted in our sense of existential fragility? Are we creatures made in God's image, or is God simply ourselves writ large? If God is primarily, maybe entirely, a projection rooted in our needs, desires, capabilities, terrors, and insecurities, maybe belief in God is not faith, but naive or primitive credulity at best, and self-idolatry at worst. To worship the work of our hands or minds is the very definition of idolatry. This raises the very real question for those whose knowledge of God is mediated primarily or exclusively by culture or church, of whether all God knowledge, all theology, is unconscious idolatry. In other words, maybe non-theism is simply rationality claiming its rightful place and responsibility by putting the God illusion out of business. A second feature of postmodernity, which heavily reinforces the suspicion about the rationality of belief in God, is the progressive rendering superfluous of the God hypothesis. God has always been, not exclusively, but importantly, the answer to our questions, the solution to our problems, the omni to our limitations. God is omnipotent, omni omniscient, <laughs> omnipresent eternal, in contrast to creatures who are limited in power, knowledge, presence, and so on. And the more incapable and powerless we experienced ourselves to be, the more invested we were in the existence of the one who could somehow handle what we could not. This realization undergird, undergirds a growing suspicion that feelings of dependence on God, perhaps even convictions about the existence of God, are more a sign or even a projection of our sense of inadequacy than objective knowledge about God. Perhaps as people mature, they have less need for the God hypothesis. In our current cultural situation, the amazing progress of our race in overcoming limits, in travel, in and outside even our planetary bounds, in range, speed, and content of communications, in regard to medical problems, including perhaps even death itself, if the transhumanists are actually onto something. The increasing sense that there is nothing worth doing that we cannot, if we are willing to expend the required resources, able to accomplish, has given many of our contemporaries a sense of having outgrown the God hypothesis. This is a scientific path to the same conclusion arrived at by the postmodern epistemologist, namely that God is simply ourselves writ large, a projection that has outlived its necessity and perhaps its usefulness. Maybe the God hypothesis is simply one way, useful for most people in times past, some people in the present, but not self-evidently necessary for all, especially in the future, to deal with the questions and challenges of life. 
The not surprising result of the inadequacy of both contemporary culture and the contemporary church to mediate the God experience of contemporary people, especially in those parts of the world often referred to as developed or postmodern, is understandably a rapid increase of people who self-identify in one way or another as non-theists. These people have rejected or simply moved beyond a stance that made sense in the cultural context of earlier times, especially in the more homogeneous sociology of knowledge of medieval Christian Europe and its successors. In many, perhaps most cases, these non-theists are not antagonistic toward religion, the God hypothesis, or the church. They may not even have formally withdrawn from the church as institution. They just find nothing life-giving in the institution or its teachings and have become progressively estranged from it, showing up for culturally or socially important events, or perhaps in times of collective tragedy, which threatens any sense, however robust, that humanity can handle its own problems. But in general, they remain personally non-committal about anything the church represents, teaches, or claims. These non-theists can be grouped in three easily recognized categories. First, there are the agnostics, that is the agnostics, who simply withhold judgment on the God question, claiming with an attractive humility that they just do not feel equipped to either deny or affirm God. So they simply suspend judgment and participation while keeping an eye out for something worthwhile in the religious sphere if such should happen to appear. A second group of non-theists, who are probably less numerous but more vocal, are the self-proclaimed atheists, atheists. They are frequently intellectuals who have devoted considerable attention to the God question and have concluded that what the term God refers to is either ourselves writ large or a projected solution to our problems rather than an objective other to whom we can relate. These atheists usually feel some urgency about justifying their stance in the eyes of their contemporaries, especially their academic peers. Explicit atheism is still a problematic position for a lot of people, even those who profess it, if only because of its apparent hubris. Humans sitting in judgment on God could find themselves in a very difficult, not to mention dangerous position, if, it, uh, happens, if they happen to be wrong. Doctrinaire atheism seems to be less a religious or theological position than a commitment to total intellectual coherence within the context of available evidence, and they don't find evidence for God. The God hypothesis, the atheist claims, is just not intellectually tenable. But the most interesting group of non-theists for our purposes are the increasingly numerous spiritual but not religious folks, or SNBRs. <laughs> There are a number of good studies, sociological and theological, of this extremely diverse group. But for our purposes, what is most interesting is what their self-proclaimed title expresses, an existentially based and behaviorally operative distinction between the spiritual and the religious. Spirituality, as they understand it, <clears throat> is a capacity for, and ideally an experience of, transcendence. Whether that occurs or is cultivated in nature, through rock music, family, love, sexuality, altruistic service, artistic expression or appreciation, meditation, health regimes, or many other places or experiences, including religious rituals, without explicit theistic claims for some people, in which a person might encounter the transcendent other. In other words, this need and quest for transcendence seems to suggest something about the human subject as such, regardless of belonging, believing, or behaving. The human just might be an intrinsically God-seeking critter. But if God, as he, has been presented by the church and academy, cannot be reasonably affirmed by a postmodern subject, maybe what or better who, this ersatz God was a stand-in for can be found by other means. In a certain sense, this group would probably be the most interesting to Rahner if he were here to pursue his thesis. We, however, are here, 
and I hope in a position to draw a major conclusion about the new religious landscape in which we find ourselves in relation to Rahner's challenging proposal, namely that the denizens of our postmodern world and culture, if they are to be religious subjects as opposed to religiously nothing at all, will have to be mystics. That is people who have direct personal experience of God as opposed to institutional affiliation, notional knowledge, behavioral rectitude, ritual competence, or just lazy espousal of quaint superstitions. But if it is the case that the traditional mediators of genuine direct first person as opposed to second hand or vicarious experience of God, namely a credible church and a religion positive culture, then the phenomenon of non-theism in its various forms can only become more pervasive until finally it is the only meaning game in town and religious people are seen as naives at best or cynical pretenders at worst. Rahner's contention is that the only alternative to this progressive de-religionizing is the person's direct personal experience of God, that is, mystical experience. The question I want to address is, is such an experience available, possible, actual in the world in which we live? And if so, what does it look like? Where can we find it and how can we access it? So I get to my hypothesis or thesis. The response I propose to this existentially urgent <clears throat> question is the hypothesis to be explored now that direct personal experiential knowledge of God, that is what Rahner called mysticism, which is not simply a projection of ourselves and or our needs, is possible in our historical setting. <coughs> Excuse me. This entails two affirmations. First, there is a real God to be known, a God who is not a construction or projection of the knower or the hypothesized response to the knower's needs. And second, there is a way to encounter this God. In other words, I'm attempting to reply to Rahner by agreeing with him <coughs> that the Christian of today must be a mystic one who lives a direct personal relationship with the living God who is the center of one's life, and to suggest that this is indeed possible, but probably not by trying to refurbish a substantialist subject-object metaphysical form of theism. So I turn to Revelation. My basic hypothesis is that the operational category in this discussion is and can only be what theology has traditionally called revelation. Revelation is precisely not an, an initiative of the creature who constructs theories about the existence, nature, and behavior of God. Nor does revelation refer to one-way communication by God of otherwise unavailable information. Revelation is not information at all, but self-gift. This is why the revelation of God can never be simply a projection of the human being and or his or her needs. This is precisely why we can and must say that revelation in the theological sense is not intellectual content or data. And thus, although it can be missed altogether, refused or misinterpreted, it cannot be dreamed up, counterfeited or projected. Uh, let me say that again, because that's at the heart of everything that I'm trying to say, that revelation, self-gift, can be missed altogether. It can be refused, or it can be misinterpreted. What it can't be is dreamed up, counterfeited, or projected. It is totally gift, not of something, but the gift of self of someone, other than myself to me. But to achieve itself as gift, it must be received. The receiver, in other words, does not constitute the gift as, su as such, but must contribute to the gift by reception of it, or nothing happens. It is in this sense, and only in this sense, that revelation is intrinsically mutual. The personal reception, engagement, 
of revelation is the response to that which is intrinsically and totally gift. The reception of the gift, what we call faith, co-constitutes God's self-gift of revelation the way the response of the beloved to the I love you of the lover co-constitutes the relationship between the two people. But the co-constitution of reception is entirely different from projection. God, if God exists, is always total self-giving. But God cannot give, that is reveal God's self, unless the recipient responds in acceptance. Humans do not construct a God to, in whom they then believe. Divine revelation is God's substantial, non-necessary, totally unanticipated self-gift to subjects capable of receiving. So a gift calling into being what heretofore did not exist, namely the receiver. Insofar as this gift is actually progressively received, appropriated, and responded to by the creature. So the self-gift creates the receiver. Revelation is therefore not a totally one-way operation. It is dialogical by nature, even though it is God who creates the receiver in order to be able to give God's self to that receiver. By contrast, for example, even though God calls into existence, that is, creates non-subject beings, the earth, plants, animals, etc., which are revelatory of God, only the human creature can receive this gift as revelation. Non-rational creation is revelatory of God. Humans are recipients of revelation to them. But it is precisely because revelation is totally gift, is God as given and received, hyphenated, that it cannot be counterfeited. It cannot be, as our theological constructions can be, the human's own projection or construction, ourselves writ large. I want to suggest at this point that a new philosophical resource, an alternative to the metaphysical subject-object approach to knowledge that has made belief in God nearly impossible for many contemporary people, may be available to us in the relatively new philosophical epistemology called phenomenology. I'm particularly intrigued by its French exponent, philosopher-theologian Jean-Luc Marion. Both metaphysical, pardon me, both metaphysical and phenomenological epistemologies are theories about the birth of meaning through the interpretation of reality. But we've just seen that the objectivist metaphysical approach in theology leads at least for many postmoderns to worshiping the construction and projections of our own minds in, in an exercise in self-referential circularity. A growing core of postmodern theologians and exegetes who talk of their work not as a science of God, the supreme object, but as a theopoetics of revelation suggests that we might be able to break out of this impasse if we could resituate this category, revelation, not within the rhetoric of science, but within the rhetoric of the arts. Revelation, as we have already seen, is not something we construct. It is something we, that, something we receive, a gift, something that happens to us, that indeed constructs us as the recipient. But you, used as we are to approaching even philosophy scientifically, on the pattern of the natural sciences, we need a new way of thinking about revelation, a theology in the service of revelation, one which begins not with theses from which deductions can be derived, but with the reception of a gift which gives rise to a relationship. We cannot even begin to elaborate on or engage this contemporary school of thought, phenomenology, in a paper of this length, but let me say a few things that might indicate its potential and the direction in which those of us who are not unwilling to check out, or who are not willing to check out of the theological enterprise, even as we keep running into dead ends, might proceed. The starting point of phenomenological theology is the understanding of revelation, not as the communication of otherwise unavailable information, but as totally gift. Or better still, it understands gift, what gives itself, as revelation. That which entices the phenomenological theologian or exegete is not a problem to be solved. It is reality, 
especially divine reality, precisely as gift to be received. In the person, for example, of Jesus, we do not encounter a metaphysical conundrum of how God can be simultaneously divine and human, which we must somehow conceptualize as the existential coincidence of two natures in one person. Rather, we are faced with a phenomenon, a showing, a manifestation, which gives itself to us in its wholeness, soliciting a response. The way a ballet gives its, itself to us even before we even know what a ballet is. The ballet arrives in our consciousness not as a combination of discrete elements, of music, of narrative movement, of erotic energy, of staging, and so on, the combination of which adds up to ballet, but as a whole, the intellig as intelligibility wrapped in beauty, as meaning soliciting a response. A phenomenon is simply that which gives itself, which appears, which arises in our experience. In that sense, everything we encounter, from an ashtray on the table to a newborn baby, is a phenomenon. Some phenomena are, in the language of this philosophy, poor, lacking in intuition, existentially and aesthetically flat, like the ashtray on the table. But other phenomena are rich, saturated with meaning and significance, defeating any effort to domesticate or own or control them, such as the newborn baby, who with its first breath, and regardless of what she will become, in some sense actually and permanently changes the whole universe in the course of history. Reality will never be the same. And of course, much that we experience falls somewhere on the spectrum between the totally banal and the truly revelatory. Religious revelation for the theological phenomenologist is what Marion calls a saturated phenomenon or an overflowing self-manifestation, an appearance or emergence of meaning so deep, rich, illuminating, challenging that we cannot grasp it as an idea wrap it up in a proposition, claim at some point to understand it so that we can now go on to something else. We do not draw conclusions from participation in a saturated phenomenon. We become a different person. The religious phenomenon draws us into itself in contemplation, draws us out of ourself ecstatically in awe and joy, or even in, even in fear or suffering too deep for expression. It does not primarily inform our mind, but forms or transforms us. We do not master the revelatory phenomenon, analyze it, formulate it, transmit it, the way we do information or a theoretical position, the conclusion of an experiment, or the discursive content of an exegesis. Rather, we are transformed by it, much as we are, but more so by the experience of beauty. Mario offers a remarkably illuminating phenomenological interpretation of the story in Luke 24, of the experience of the risen Jesus by two disciples walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, in which we see how a seemingly banal phenomenon in ordinary conversation and country meal is charged with revelatory meaning. The Christian saturated phenomenon par excellence is Jesus himself the revelation in person of God, the supreme mystery. We could say that Jesus is the phenomenon, the very appearance of God. In Jesus, God gives God's self to us, not to be analyzed or explained or proved. Rather, God in Jesus gives God's self to us to be loved. We have no more need nor possibility to analyze or prove God given in Jesus than we do to prove that a Cezanne is beautiful, or to surrender to a Beethoven symphony, or to make love to our spouse or rejoice in our friend. The appropriate response to revelation experienced as theopoesis, rather than as theological theory, is not analysis but participation, by means of which we do not so much know more as become more. Knowledge by participation, or what Rahner called mysticism, is not so much an enlightenment of the rational mind as a transformation of the whole person. Ecstasy, 
Mystical participation that draws the subject out of him or herself, whether in nature, in friendship, in art, in knowledge, in prayer, is the model of what Rahner was saying would be the only kind of genuine access to the living God for the Christian who finds her or himself in the arid land of postmodernity, in a world which we, in which we can know everything in terms of rational knowledge, but truly know nothing in terms of communion. When we look at the loci, the places where we encounter and participate in revelation as it takes place for the Christian believer, we know that these loci are virtually all what phenomenologists call theopoetic realities, aesthetic realities that make, that construct, that give form to revelation through participation. Some of these loci are Jesus himself, the supreme incarnation of revelation. In the drama of his life and the language of his preaching, scripture, which is literature in multiple aesthetic forms, Liturgy, which is participative drama. Community, which is a social embodiment of spiritual interconnectedness. Sacraments, which are rituals in which we encounter the realities of human interaction in those uh, realities, the presence and action of Jesus in our midst. All of these, of course, can be transmuted into dead ritualism or desiccated abstract theology but they are first and foremost and originally theopoetic realities. That is aesthetic embodiments of reality to be encountered, shared, lived, rather than intellectual abstractions from experience into formulas. They are, when they work, overflowing, saturated phenomena, loci where meaning overwhelms its expressions and possesses its participants, rather than the participants possessing and domesticating the reality through formulation in exact language. The incarnation introduces us into a totally original understanding of revelation, not as information about God, but as the encountering of the intrinsically invisible, nonsensible reality of God in our embodied experience in this world. Jesus is God, incarnate as a human being, and in our interaction with that visible human being, we directly and personally encounter the invisible God who is pure spirit. Jesus is the embodied lesson, so to speak, of how revelation takes place in the Judeo-Christian dispensation, which is not primarily by rational discourse. That comes later. We use the formula, God became human, in the fully bodily spiritual sense of the word human, in Jesus. God became not visible in God's self, but remaining intrinsically invisible, became seeable, hearable, touchable in Jesus. We don't look at the earthly Jesus and take flight toward the invisible by a platonic withdrawal from the sensible. Rather, we see and embrace the invisible God in the visibility, which is this human being, Jesus. Phenomenological experience, particularly as Marion explicates it in relation, in relation to the visual arts, is a wonderful resource for understanding how God becomes actually seen in Jesus, even as God remains invisible in God's self. In other words, how Jesus enables us to fulfill Rahner's requirement that the Christian in the postmodern context must have direct personal experience of God not just information or reasonable conclusions or authoritative teaching about God, if she or he is to be a Christian, as opposed to simply knowing about or believing in Christianity. I will illustrate this at the end of the paper in relation to the resurrection very, very briefly. The supreme revelation in Christianity, as it is presented in the first pericope in John's resurrection narrative. But at this point, it's helpful to say something about how as phenomenology presents it, revelation occurs how the invisible is actually seen in the visibility of the phenomenon. Mario, in a number of his writings, but especially in his wonderful book, Crossing the Visible, discusses a double dialectic, that between the seen and the unseen, and that between the visible and the invisible, and the intimate relation between these two. 
he points out that the unseen is something that is in intrinsically seeable, for example, an umbrella in a dark closet, but not actually seen because it's in the dark. If one shines a light in the closet, the actually unseen, though intrinsically seeable, will not only become seeable, which was all along, but actually seen. But some things are not only unseen, but intrinsically invisible, such as the divinity of Jesus. In Mark 15, there is a detailed account of Jesus' last hours on the cross. The crowd around the cross included many people who interpreted what they were seeing, what they were experiencing. Some were mocking Jesus for his messianic claims and challenging him to save himself as he had saved others. Others thought that he was calling on Elijah to rescue him, take him down from the cross. But at the moment of Jesus' death, the Roman centurion in charge of the execution, a pagan who probably knew nothing of the messianic references the bystanders were evoking, quote, saw how he, Jesus, died and exclaimed, truly, this man was God's son, unquote. What the, what the centurion saw physically was how Jesus died, which everyone present could see. But what he bore witness to, that is what he actually saw, was what was revealed in the death, something that was not physically seeable, but was known in what was seen, namely how Jesus died. Divinity is intrinsically invisible and could not be seen with the physical eyes. But Mark says that it was precisely in what the centurion did see physically, namely how Jesus died, that the centurion saw spiritually, that is by revelation, what could not be seen physically, that Jesus was the Son of God. In the scene, the invisible became visible to the one who had eyes to see. He was not reading into the scene. He did not even have the categories to do so. This pagan, without benefit of the scriptures, certainly not in ecstasy on Calvary, actually saw in the mundane, seeable reality of Jesus expiring what could not be seen physically, but only by revelation, Jesus' divinity. He was not seeing physically anything other than what the other bystanders saw. But he saw spiritually what they, even with the advantage of the scriptures and their previous experience of Jesus, could not see what could not be seen with the physical eyes, namely Jesus' true identity as Son of God. And just as an aside, something like this seems to happen to some pilgrims who vividly encounter Mary in the Virgin of Guadalupe, while others looking at the same painting in the same place at the same time see only a painting. The text is clear that the centurion did not see physically anything not available to the physical sight of anyone else at the scene. His seeing was simultaneously a physical event and a spiritual illumination or revelation of the real meaning of the event. Like the spouse who experiences in a glance or a touch what no one else who is present gets, even though they saw the same gesture. For the centurion, it was a spiritual seeing of the intrinsically invisible in the physically seen moment of death. Revelation is not an explosion of unusual phenomena or a private vision of what is unseen by others. It is a making visible spiritually by God of what is physically invisible but revealed in the physically seen. Jesus' physical seeable death was the visibility of the invisible, namely Jesus' identity as son, surrendering himself totally into the hands of the one he called father seen only by the one prepared to see it, who, significantly, was not one of those who should have understood what was going on. The Jewish bystanders were quoting scripture, even arguing theologically. But the text they knew did not make visible to them the invisible. What was seen by them and the centurion left the revealed invisible and unseen to those unable to see while the invisible revealed itself in the scene to the one person there who was able to see, that is, who was open to revelation. This is what revelation means. It is not the communication of esoteric information. That which is intrinsically invisible to the physical 
sense of sight, for example, divinity, is visible in the scene of ordinary material reality to the eyes of faith. Marion speaks of this as the visibility of the invisible. He uses the phenomenon of perspective in a painting to demonstrate how, if the viewer is properly positioned, the viewer can see, in a very real sense, what in physical fact is not there, but is really visible. The depth of the countryside, which is how the real countryside really is, can be seen in the physically flat painting by the viewer who is in the right position. The intrinsically invisible personal, as opposed to physical, beauty of this woman can be seen by the man who is in the right position that of being in love with her, even as it remains perhaps completely invisible to someone present but not in love with her. The right position for seeing divine revelation is being in the spirit, which is what faith really is. Faith does not change the physical phenomenon any more than perspective changes the flat canvas or love changes the personal appearance or, or social self-presentation of the beloved. Just as the painting is still physically flat, Jesus is really physically dead on the cross, Eucharistic bread is still bread, not accidents inherent in substantive nothingness, but there is a genuine seeing of the invisible which is really mediated by the seemingly opaque material. As the use of perspective allows the physically flat painting to make the mountain appear as it truly is in reality in the background, a kind of spiritual perspective, faith, allows the real bread to make Jesus really present as what he really is, the spiritual nourishment of the believer. The physical death of Jesus reveals his true identity as the eternal and deathless Son of God. This phenomenological approach to revelation is plainly much better suited to contemporary experience than attempts, for example, to explain the Eucharist as a change of substance while the accidents of bread and wine somehow remain suspended in metaphysical midair. It opens up the real possibility of revelation that does not do away with the actual physical experience in time of the one sensing, but makes that sensing itself capable of mediating what cannot be sensed. And in a few minutes I want to say something about that in relationship to uh, the great central revelation in Christianity, the resurrection, and its communication to us in a theopoetic text. This schema was well known to the medievals as the doctrine of the spiritual senses, which functioned in everyday life, as well as opening the scriptures to spiritual exegesis. It's hard for moderns to take something like spiritual senses seriously, but the alternative, at least for many people, is either a kind of counter-experiential make-believe or just a willed suspension of non-belief, despite evidence to the contrary, which makes less and less sense as the person goes along. It remains at this point to make one further observation, namely about the essentially theopoetic or aesthetic rather than abstractly metaphysical mediation of revelation in a phenomenological framework. As we've just seen, in a metaphysical approach to revelation, the primary mode of communication is, is philosophical language. So the incarnation of God in Jesus must be discussed in terms of two natures in one person, or the Eucharist in terms of the distinction between substance and accidents. Needless to say, since none of this can be observed in the phenomena being discussed, the believer has to suspend the functioning of her or his natural faculties in an act of literally blind faith. A phenomenological approach to revelation does not make a total disjunction between what is sensed and what is really there or what is really happening. Faith does not contradict the senses as it does in a metaphysical approach which says you see, touch, taste, bread, but by an act of willed credulity you must affirm what you do not sense, namely this is Jesus. While with your senses you do experience what well, you must not affirm that this is just bread. It's a nice trick if you can keep pulling it off. The, the phenomenological approach is not a matter of the physical or sensible opposing the spiritual, 
a denial of one to, in order to affirm the other, but is a use of the sensible artistic medium to mediate the spiritual reality. Just as an artistic portrait captures the personality of the subject precisely by, not in spite of the, of the painting, so revolution, revelation understood in phenomenological terms does not speak against the material in which it is manifest, but through it. Thus, the realities of human experience can actually manifest, reveal, mediate the reality of God, not by way of negation or contrast, but by way of affirmation. God is manifest, not exhaustively, but really, in and through this limited material. Now, let me make one last point, which cannot be developed here, but must be in the background for what we'll now see very briefly and inadequately, but I hope suggestively, about the resurrection. The shift from metaphysics to phenomenology as a way of thematizing our experience of revelation involves a shift from theology, theology to theopoetics as the appropriate method and language for the comprehension and transmission of revelation in scripture and other revelatory phenomena. Theology is ordered talk about God, that is rational discourse. Different languages have been used to do theology. For example, Platonic idealistic philosophy or Aristotelian hylomorphic philosophy or more modernly, process philosophy, linguistic analysis, critical social theory, and so on. These languages have in common their second order character. For example, they transpose the biblical data of Revelation, which is primarily first order or aesthetic language, so narrative. If you think about scripture, what's in scripture? Narrative, poetry, drama, hymns, rituals, historical fiction, genealogies, parables, and so on. So it transforms that language into theoretical constructions, which it is argued helpfully objectify the squishy language of artistic presentations into hard forms that can be controlled, compared, analyzed, argued about, and so on. Phenomenology, although itself a philosophy with a highly abstract and even abstruse theoretical structure and vocabulary, restricts the use of these second order operations to explaining after the fact of direct aesthetic encounter with the text through reading, preaching, singing, or some other interpretive method, what the subject, the reader or the hearer of scripture is doing. So in other words, doesn't do away with this type of analysis, but it, instead of using it on the theopoetic material, uses it on the person who's examining the material. So, it's like discussing the structure of a play, its vocabulary or the quality of the acting and so on after the performance. If you did that analysis during the performance, you would completely miss the dramatic experience. A phenomenological approach to the biblical text engages the texts themselves as they stand. So it reads narratives as stories, not casings for dogmatic positions and drama as drama, not esoteric codes for real events. And vision accounts as accounts of visions, not as psychological distortions of reality or imaginary adventures. In other words, theopoetics is an aesthetic, first order engagement with the texts of Revelation, which are by nature theopoetic, that is, artistic constructions. This has very important consequences for the interpretation of scripture. It is not the point of theopoetic biblical interpretation to get behind the text to find out what the author intended, to ferret out the ideological commitments of the author, to determine whether the experience described or narrated, for example, whether the bush was actually on fire, or what theological commitments motivated the putative author, and so on. Nor is it the intention to get in front of the text for example, to draw moral lessons from the text. Those are all valid questions, but for another time, an area of inquiry. What the theopoetic reader of the text wants to do is what the theater goer or the museum visitor wants to do, namely to engage in the poesis, to surrender to what self presents of the text in order to be moved, changed, delighted or distressed, puzzled, enlightened, and so on. 
And as one lives these experiences, one is transformed by them. Exegesis is about objective information. Theopoetics is about subjective transformation. In other words, the goal of second order scientific exegesis, like that of systematic theology, is theoretical information which will be deciphered, analyzed, organized, and systematized to promote many perfectly legitimate goals, but at some subsequent moment. The goal of first order theopoetic biblical interpretation is personal transformation of the reader in and by the process of engagement so that the reader will be able, if it is desired, to engage in biblically informed theological work at some subsequent moment. The interpretive reading we'll now engage in very, very briefly is an explicitly theopoetic endeavor. We will let, even facilitate, the text giving what it wants to give. We will try to be receptive beneficiaries of the gift rather than make the text provide us with data for our personal or scholarly purposes. So I want to look at John 20, 1 to 10, experiencing the risen Jesus. I'll now attempt very briefly to demonstrate the working of the theory just set forth in relation to the first pericope in the resurrection account in the Gospel of John. First, recall what is well known, the originality of Christianity, as well as its most daunting challenge for many people, is the kerygma of the bodily resurrection of Jesus a completely unprecedented response to the universal and primordial human tragedy, death. In a sense, humanity generally has never really accepted that human life can be, must always be, finally and definitively snuffed out in utter nothingness. The human spirit demands to live. This is probably the most basic distinguishing feature of the human among all creatures. So virtually all human communities have developed some kind of refusal of death, theories of resuscitation, transmigration of souls, and or reincarnation, a diminished continuance of life in Sheol or Hades or the Elysian fields, immortality of the bodiless soul, reabsorption of the person into the cosmos as some form of cosmic energy, embodiment of the spirit of the great person in a cause that goes on, or in the great works of art or learning that one has bequeathed to subsequent generations. And of course, in the most realistic protest against death, in one's physical descendants. Christianity distinguished itself from all its predecessors and contemporaries by espousing none of these attempts to mitigate the finality of death, but announcing that after being certified dead and buried for three days, Jesus literally rose bodily from death appeared to his astonished disciples and interacted with them, and after a specified period of time, departed bodily from them after assuring them that he would remain with them, in them, active through them until the end of time. There is nothing really comparable to this in any culture or religion. And many, even of Jesus' own disciples, have tried to tone this down, turn the resurrection into some kind of metaphor or symbol, or explain it away with various linguistic slates of hand. Bodily resurrection remains, as it was for Paul's audience in, in Corinth, the assembling block for many who otherwise find Christianity more than worthy of commitment. The church has always refused the attempts to domesticate the resurrection, insisting week after week, we believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. If there is a biblical text that challenges any theory of interpretation, including the phenomenological, the textual proclamation of the resurrection is it. So let's see what a phenomenological approach to John's account of the resurrection transmitted in a theopoetic text might yield. Each of the four gospels has a distinctive final chapter announcing narratively, that is aesthetically, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. There is enough overlap among them that there can be no doubt that bodily resurrection is what the church believed from the beginning. One can question the truth of the proclamation, but no one who can read can question the fact of the proclamation. Paul's accounts of his experience of seeing the risen Jesus after the departure of Jesus by the ascension corroborate the gospel evidence 
So no matter how many literary, philosophical, religious, or psychological gambits are tried, there is no avoiding or even deliteralizing the church's proclamation that Jesus really physically died, was seen buried in a tomb, whose location was known to credible eyewitnesses, and that three days later his tomb was empty, his corpse was never found, and he was seen bodily alive by a large but select assortment of his disciples who recognized him, interacted with him for a specified amount of time, and then began at his command to preach this whole story all over the known world. We're stuck with this. <laughs> and here we are today with the story pretty much intact, despite 20 centuries of attempts, ingenuous to ingenious, to modify it, to tone it down, to explain it away, or even to deny it. We cannot do what I originally intended to do in this paper, namely interpret the whole of John's resurrection narrative, chapters 20 and 21 of the gospel, which we'll have to wait for a later occasion, probably a book. But I hope my main purpose in relation to this project can be achieved by the interpretation of one pericope of John 20, the eight, nine verses actually, that introduce and adumbrate the whole resurrection proclamation according to the fourth gospel. More clearly than in the other gospels, John 20 is a single integrated narrative composed of four episodes, none of which is narratively or theological freestanding in relation to the other three. Even though in the liturgical lectionary, each of the four is read separately, interspersed with pericopes from the other gospels, so that the narrative integrity of the chapter can be missed by the ordinary Sunday listener. I want to interpret the first episode, which is introduced by the discovery of the open tomb by Mary Magdalene, the primary apostolic witness to the resurrection in John, so we're in serious territory. She reports her interpretation of the open tomb. They have taken away the Lord from the tomb. To two of the disciples, namely, uh, the unnamed beloved disciple who certifies the apostolic authenticity of the fourth gospel tradition itself, and Simon Peter, who in John's gospel connects the distinctive Johannine tradition to the broader tradition of the primitive church carried by the synoptic gospels. In short, this apparently bland episode, which seems to end so indecisively with everyone apparently still in the dark about the meaning and outcome of Calvary, is symbolically freighted for the reader in the know, the reader formed by the 19 chapters that preceded it. This pericope follows on the first two verses of John 20, which recount Mary's discovery of the open tomb and her announcement of this fact to Simon Peter and the beloved disciple. She misinterprets it. She says they have taken him out of the tomb, but the fact is she testifies to the open and empty tomb. The pericope itself comprises the following that, only eight verses to 10, and involves no appearance of the risen Jesus. It ends in seeming ambiguity. The disciples, suspended between believing and ignorance, we are told that the beloved disciple, in contrast to Simon Peter, saw and believed. We call the mark and scene at the foot of the cross. But that neither the beloved disciple nor Simon Peter understood about the resurrection. So, the disciple, beloved disciple believed what? I will shortly suggest that this low key, somewhat ambiguous experience of these three symbolic figures is precisely what makes this least dramatic of all the resurrection material in the New Testament so important. It is the perfect connector between the experience of the apostolic generation who participated directly and sensibly in Jesus' public life and paschal mystery as it occurred in history and the subsequent believers, like us, who share substantially in that primal experience, but do so in the not seeing yet believing that Jesus declared blessed to Thomas a week later. Not seeing and believing is the faith of all those, including ourselves, down through the ages, who, through the visibility of the invisible, grasped in and through what is seen, will come to resurrection faith. The pericope is stru subtly structured by the precise use of three Greek words for seeing. The first is blepo, which denotes the simple visual registering of what usually physically or quasi-physically presents itself, like the ashtray on the table. The second, theoreo, from which we get the English word theory, 
denotes the thoughtful engagement with the perceived object, physical or otherwise, so it could be an idea or a thing, in the search for meaning, which usually involves placing what is perceived in some context in which it either does or does not make sense. The third term is horao, which denotes the true intuitive grasp, the penetration of the significance of what is seen, whether physical or intellectual. It is what we mean when we say of something shared with us, oh, I see what you are saying. It is the seeing and believing that in John's gospel signifies salvific faith. When the beloved disciple arrives first at the tomb and peers in from outside, seeing only the empty grave claws, that's what he could see from outside, the verb is blepo. He visually registers what his eyes report. Simon Peter then arrives and enters the tomb. He sees all the physically available evidence, all the seeable, that is, the, t the open tomb empty of Jesus' body, the empty and discarded burial wrappings, including both the body shroud, which the beloved disciples saw from outside, and the definitively retired face veil wrapped up and laid aside. In other words, he sees all the evidence available. He thoughtfully engages them. The word is theoreo. But finally, Peter draws a blank. He does not get it. His theoretical framework for handling life and death is inadequate to illuminate the experience. The beloved disciple then, finally entering the tomb and seeing what he did not see from outside, namely not only the discarded grave claws, but the veil, the sign of death that had covered the face of the dead Jesus, definitively wrapped up and put aside, grasped the invisible, that Jesus is glorified in the visible, the definitively retired face veil. Jesus, the new Moses, who is now definitively in the presence of God, and unlike the first Moses, will never need to veil his divine glory in mortal flesh again, is not dead, but alive. The beloved disciple, we are told, through the use of the third verb, horao, sees and believes, like the centurion in Mark. That is, he comes to believing insight into the mystery of Jesus' glorification, even though he does not physically see the bodily risen Jesus, nor any physical evidence other than what Peter saw. He experiences the visibility of the invisible in what is seen, the face veil, definitively set aside, retired from service. He sees in the grave symbolic content that which mediates his believing in the now risen Jesus even though the latter is not physically seen. What is so important and enlightening about this seemingly mundane, banal, some people think pointless scene, what's it doing in the gospel, is that it lays out for the reader in every age, narratively, that is theopoetically, rather than theoretically or discursively, the mysterious dynamic of faith, a word John's gospel never uses, because for this evangelist, Openness to divine revelation is not a noun, faith, an object, something one can have or not have, but always a verb, something a free subject chooses to do in response to the gift of revelation incarnate in Jesus. Thus, the contrast is not between those who have faith and those who do not, but between those who choose to believe, to accept the gift that is offered, and those who choose not to. When someone says, I love you, the answer, prove it, is pointless. Either we experience the love to which the other has testified, or we don't. Believing cannot be commanded or coerced, nor be the result of discursive reasoning. There is no compelling proof of the existence of God, or of the resurrection, or of the divinity of Jesus. It is the experience of the one in whom we live and move and have our being, now revealed in one who has conquered death, that elicits the believing response, I love you. This brings us back to our starting point, the contemporary situation in which, as Rahner said, people will either experience God personally and directly, though mediated in multiple ways, or they will live in a God-empty universe, in and as the spiritual nothing at all that is the only alternative to revelation-drenched experience. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Schneider. We can do a question and answer. Oh. So if you can stay up there for a few minutes. If anyone has any questions for Professor Schneider, we'll open up the floor uh, for a few minutes there. I'll thank you, Jacinta, for helping out with the microphone. If you please just uh, stand up and let me know that you have a question. Hold, hold on, hold on a second. We need to get the microphones. We've got one in the back behind you. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, my interest is in finding out your theopoetic approach. Is it part of a narrative interpretive approach, or is it separate from it? Well, a narrative approach would be a theopoetic approach. But for example, um, when Jesus Christ Superstar uh, came out, uh, that was a theopoetic uh, interpretation of the gospel that had tremendous appeal to all kinds of people who probably never studied scripture or theology. Uh, and a lot of the questioning that went on by critics and so on, not by the art, art critics, but by the theologians, was how true was it to the text? Uh, uh, how good was the theology? In other words, they were trying to take the theopoetic presentation and turn it back into questions of fact, questions of exegesis, questions of theology, and so on, because if they engaged it as it stood, what would happen to them would be a lot more dangerous for a lot of people than what would happen to them if they simply did a theology of the uh, hypostatic union. So uh, the answer to your question is, if you turn the question around, uh, narrative interpretation is one form of the theopoetic interpretation. A musical production could be another. A poem could be another. The mystical literature of Julian of Norwich could be another. And, and uh, let me just say this as well, that theopoetic interpretations preceded scientific ones. They were fully operative in the early church when the disciples were preaching the gospel. <laughs> and when Paul tried to pull a theology act in Athens, he got run out of town. Thank you. There was, some, there was somebody up here. Regarding phenomenology, you mentioned Jean-Luc, someone. What Marion, who was, was mentioned by our speaker last night as well. He's a, okay. Well, actually, his colleagues can tell you more about him than I can. Okay, uh, thank you. Bernie and... Um, uh, do one of you want to say something about who Jean-Luc Marion is? Oh, <laughs> J-E-A-N hyphen L-U-C M-A-R-I-O-N. And he teaches sometimes, uh, I guess regularly every year at the University of Chicago, uh, but he's actually French. Mm -hmm. I have kind of a, a pastoral question, sort of unpacking something that you've laid out here that's just so interesting to me uh, what it, it started uh, cooking in me when you talked about the centurion receiving the revelation it, it, in some ways a hundred percent right and I, I've been reading Shelley Rambo who has a, uh, she writes on trauma and theology and she has a, an interpretation of this same passage and John is she really emphasizes um, the trauma that Mary Magdalene has experienced and then her her inability to see completely because it's dark and she's weeping and there's so many things that are confusing and yet she does get the revelation like the gift happens and I I just think pastorally that's such an interesting implication here because sometimes I think we think that there are limiting factors for people's ability to receive God and that trauma, really intense trauma is one of those. But I think you've opened up here a way to think about that in which the gift can be received by anyone 100% through the relationship. 
and not in spite of their experience, but exactly. because of their experience. In fact, my own interpretation, which has been published a couple of times on the Mary Magdalene scene in the garden, uh, it, it, I, what I do is trace Mary Magdalene's subjective experience from deep spiritual blinding sadness through conversion to being able to see. Uh, and it's precisely in our life experience that, I mean, the reason that a, a sensible spiritual seeker is not going to seek spiritual direction from an 18-year-old, you wouldn't? No. Yeah. Uh, is precisely because human experiences, which we tend to say, emotions cloud your mind. Huh? Uh, so feelings incapacitate you for the kind of clear metaphysical uh, thinking that's necessary to get revelation straight. Whereas it's precisely our capacity for feeling, our capacity for the same capacity that enables us to empathize deeply in a theater production or to uh, experience love. The only people who can tell you about the love of God, as I think we'll hear talking about some of the mystics, is somebody who's been in love. So rather than seeing these as impediments that cloud your mind and keep you from thinking clearly and therefore you can't figure out what's going on, it's precisely our capacity to enter into through the theopoetic text or through the sacramental experience, you know, or through the personal trauma that, that enable us to receive revelation whole. And then we can go and parse it out. We can say, you know, I had this experience and I knew very well that even though, according to all the books, I'm in a state of existential mortal sin, I knew that I was completely held and safe in the love of God. And somebody says, ha ha, don't you wish. You know, and you say, no, I know, I experienced it. Then we can begin to unpack that and say, how is it that a person who, on the books, is in a desperate moral situation, is held closely, lovingly, by God? Then we begin to work out a theology of mercy, a theology of, you know, of God being better at this than us. Um, <laughs> surprise. Uh, but the theology comes after the fact. So like I can look at the effects of uh, misogynist biblical interpretation and outline it through the, through the history, uh, but when I go back to how this got loose in the church and say, ah, now we can see how this happened and why it happened. Then we can begin to build a liberationist feminist uh, theology, for example, for biblical interpretation. But it comes after the fact. So rather than try to go back and say, well, what was the intention of the author in writing this misogynist text? And was it legitimate or was it not legitimate? We're starting from this end, from the experience of what the misogynist text has done, and going back to the text with this data and experience, and then we can do a whole theology of uh, anti-woman biblical interpretation. If we start with that, we're not going to get very far. Uh, at least that's my theory. I could be wrong. <laughs> oh, I've got one here. Dr. Snyder, I don't know. I know this is a very academic study. I do have a degree in theology, but I teach ordinary Catholic, pew Catholics, and I teach scripture from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible, which I've done for about 30 years. It takes me 36 weeks, but these are just ordinary people, okay? And, and, you know, I do teach the contextual approach and all that, but I'm thinking, I, I give them a personal experience like you were talking about to them, because it's an experience that I was taught high Christology as a kid, pre-Vatican, and then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ Superstar came along, and I thought, wow, he's really human. It was an experience, not in my head, what you're talking about, a poetic idea. And I, I told him, I, I did look at the theology of it, that the apostles always knew they were going to write and all that stuff. <laughs> I used that with him, but I told him it changed. It was a conversion for me because as a child, I didn't feel sorry for Jesus. 
you know, I'd go to the station, oh, he's God. <laughs> he didn't get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I just share it at their level. This is all your real theological up there, but how do you get it? I was telling her, I, I teach regular people, so I have to bring it down to their level so they can fall in love with the scriptures. But when it gets to the resurrection, I was a young sister, and I, I think I was at Incarnate Word, or maybe I was here at St. Mary's. But the priest on, uh, was given us a lecture, and he said, and here we're all sitting there, and this is a long time ago, Nobody was more surprised at the resurrection than Jesus. <laughs> Boy, did that, it just broke out. The next day at breakfast, there was nothing but talk. But I had a tremendous conversion at that moment. Mm. And I tell the people in my class, every year when I teach Mark, I, just, I tell them, and I go, oh, these are ordinary Catholics, and shock them to death. But I tell them, it changed my life. I fell madly in love with God. Mm. At that moment, when that priest said that, I thought, wow. He didn't say, well, in three days, I'm getting out of this thing. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> he died just like us. And I tell him, I have no clue I'm going to see God when I die. I don't know that. But I believe. And Jesus says, something good's going to come out of this. But if I hadn't heard that priest shock me as a young sister, I don't know if I would have ever. So now that you're giving me words or vocabulary to what I'm thinking, I'm all through this talk. I thought, how am I going to tell this to the people, you know, at their <laughs> level? How am I going to explain what I'm doing now is just saying, what does it say about God in the scripture? What does it tell you about God? Because it's all about God. Not all this little detail of who did what and who killed who. What does it say about God? And being a spiritual director now, in my age, older age, not 18, you know, the wisdom. So I, I want to thank you. It's, I don't know if it's a question in a way. I'm just my experience. When you deal with ordinary, I don't know if anybody here teaches ordinary people right in the street. I'm not teaching at a university level. So to bring it down to their level, I'm what you said was very enlightening to me. And am I interpreting that right? Yeah. Well, that you're the interpreter. It's your know, experience. A poetic way of uh, looking at it. Was that what they were trying to teach us? There? Well, I, the thing that strikes me in what you're saying here is that I, I would urge you and, and other people, especially pastoral ministers, don't think that you're talking to ordinary people, little people, just who don't know much and who are, you know, you got to uh, feed them pablum because... Uh, it's precisely people, we might say, who aren't corrupted by theology, who get, who get it. You know, by the time you uh, run around in second, uh, second order uh, discourse for a, a certain amount of time, it could make it impossible to actually pray. You know, it's like the theater critic who absolutely cannot not focus on every misinflection or every... Uh, you know, and who finally writes a, a critique of the play that has knocked the socks off the audience and proves that it was a very mediocre performance. Now, uh, the, the scriptures were not written for biblical scholars or by biblical scholars. Uh, now, that doesn't say biblical scholars don't have a point, but they come after the fact, not before. So if you're dealing with people who are reading the scriptures as it is, your job is to... F Pardon me, <laughs> I would think that the job of the person in that position would be to facilitate the actual reading that's going on. Now, why do people meditate on the passion of Jesus when they're suffering profoundly? Because they get it. Now, if Jesus was actually just play acting and saying, you know, three days from now it'll all be over, and, you know, uh, that would not touch the heart of anybody who just lost their newborn child or who just got a, a terminal diagnosis with cancer. So the way into real revelation is through human experience, which usually is better mediated to us by the arts than it is by abstract, which is not to say that the second order language doesn't have a very important point. If it didn't have some point, I would not be standing here doing precisely second order interpretation. But if I didn't have anything to interpret, I wouldn't be here either. <laughs> That's the other half. Um, thank you so much for all the contributions you've done in terms of helping us think about, especially in us in academia, about how we should do what we do in terms of maybe shifting from a theology of logic to a theopoetics. My question is, is in terms of the field today, who are people, theologians, theological thinkers, who have done a great job of starting with the arts as the primary modality of understanding how God reveals God's self to us, gives God's self, to then moving to the second order discourse. Because I think it's necessary but not sufficient just to talk about 
revelation or the arts as mm -hmm. the principal modality of appreciating, being surrendered to, giving yourself to um, the reality of God. But then there's the sufficient to continue that process. And so I'm always looking for people who we think or we lift up as exemplars in ad adopting the kind of methodology that you're advocating. Um, I know that your own work does that, but I'm wondering who? if any other people in the field who you, you appreciate do that from arts, from the arts to the sciences, because we are in the College of Arts and Sciences, right? So Yeah, I, I don't think it's like one and then two. It, it's, if you're dealing with an artistic form, for example, you're dealing with a gospel, which is primarily literature, it's first literature, that your first way in probably should not be by taking it apart, undoing it, and sp spreading out all the pieces, and then seeing if you could figure out how to put it back together again. Uh, if you're dealing with something which is a theological construction, let's say you're studying um, uh, uh, Rahner, okay? You're studying Rahner. Rahner is doing theology in a philosophical mode. If you start by saying, now what's the story that Rahner is telling? <laughs> You're not gonna get anywhere. So I, if I'm listening to somebody in spiritual direction, it's not the same as if I'm listening to somebody who's my doctoral student who's come in. So the, the point is, I think, to uh, not to find what we think is the way to do whatever it is, theology or whatever. Uh, so the priest who comes out and explains the whole theology of the liturgy so that the people will get it. Well, number one, they're probably so distracted by the time it starts that they can't enter into the drama of liturgy. On the other hand, if people enter well into liturgy and they can't find anybody who can tell them why it works <laughs> and help them to get to a different approach. So it's not an either or. It's not like saying throw the theologians out, no, bring in the theopoets and we'll be home free. Uh, but you know, people, um, uh, all the names escape me, but all the people who were working in narrative theology for many years, uh, people like John Shea, you know, uh, who were basically doing this sort of thing. Uh, I think one of the finest, finest, finest examples of this is the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd have you heard of that? Yeah, I, I mean that is that is a marvelous example, uh, worked out by a primary school teacher, uh, and now it's it's all over the world. But it, it's kind of a Montessori of of, of the catechesis. Uh, so the question is not you know let's find the one that really works and use it and throw out the rest of the stuff. Uh, if you do metaphysics on Julian of Norwich, it better be th three or four steps down the road it, where you don't jump over and say, well, of course, you know, nobody actually has these experiences. She was just having theological experiences and wrapping them up in language that ordinary people could understand. So I, what I'm pleading for here is a change of our mentality that affirms our total experience. You know, how do, and revelation is this term that tries to cover the entire encounter between God and humans that is initiated not by the human, but by God, and has to somehow reach us in our human condition. And so, as we developed our theology of revelation to become more and more abstract reasoning, in my opinion, we lost touch with the revelatory character of revelation. And some of this stuff is trying to reintegrate it. So. This will be the last question. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you very much what? for this. I'm over here, oh. Sandra. <laughs> No, thanks. Um, talk with that, without moving your mouth. <laughs> I come from the point of view of a very right-brained pastoral minister who's been immersed in working with laity since 1970 in Detroit, by the way, with John Nolan. Um, and I just, this has been music to my ears and especially to my heart. 
Um, I just want to mention that everything that you're saying about Theopoiesis, I think, is truly alive in the Hispanic community today, especially the community on the border and certainly here. And some of us will have the delight of celebrating Oscar Romero's canonization on Sunday in the midst of the Hispanic community. I think if you want an experience of Theopoiesis, go. Good. Thanks. Yes. Uh, if you watch what, uh, what theologians get attacked by the Vatican, you'll find a strong strain of exactly what made Oscar Romero uh, blacklisted for so long. That's precisely this integration that uh, when we don't have any categories for something, we've got one catch-all category to put all of those crazy ideas into its heresy. So anything that sounds exciting or original, the basket for that is heresy. <laughs> and Oscar Romero is, yes, 